It really was weird for me when I went to Copenhagen and they had it in the bleeding edge track. So the first time I actually talked about event sourcing was at QCon 2007. Um, Martin was actually at this talk and I was scared senseless. So I'm coming and talking about new ideas around domain driven design, um, messaging and these kinds of ideas. And my front row was Martin, Eric Evans and Gregor Hope. <laughs> I think I probably had about 30 glasses of coffee before I started, and I went through my entire talk in like 17 minutes. It was a really awful talk. Uh, to be fair, I think Martin gave me a red card. Eric even told me it was a bad talk, which if you've never met Eric, he doesn't really say <laughs> bad things. <laughs> but it's, n it's not new ideas, and even going back as far as like 2006, 2007, these ideas go way back, way past that. What really brought us towards looking at event sourcing was that we needed to have a log and we need to have a proper audit. Now, for some systems, this is very, very important. For other systems, it's not so important. That's what led us towards the idea of event sourcing. And I've actually used this slide now since 2007 because the slide is so perfect. What's interesting for me when we talk about event sourcing is that if you look at mature businesses, and when I say mature, I do not mean Groupon. Every single one of them event sources, conceptually. Finance, banking, gambling, insurance, all of them are naturally event sourced. How many of you have a bank account? Do you think that your balance is a column in a table? Or is your balance an equation? Your balance is a summation of all the previous transactions that have happened on your account, correct? What if it were just a column? So you think that you should have 10,000 crown, the bank says you have 1,200 crown. And you call them up on the phone and say, I think my balance is wrong. And they say, all hail the column. <laughs> it's not really uh, useful. But if I say that your balance is a summation of all the previous transactions that have happened on your account before, can we take out a pen and paper and figure out what your balance should be? You can argue about whether or not a fact exists, but you cannot argue about the overall result that's derived from them. This is one of the main reasons businesses are actually going towards event sourcing. Having this first level derivative that is provable or disprovable is actually a very, very valuable thing. We're going to talk about it more, but there's a lot of other reasons why all of these industries have gone and they're naturally event sourced. Before we get into those though, let's go up with a definition of event sourcing. When you talk about an event source system, you only store facts. All state in your system is a first level derivative off of your facts. Just like we said, bank balance is an equation that runs off of your transactions. All state can be worked this way. We can say that we will only ever store events inside of a system and any state that you want to have, I don't care whether it's a read model, whether it's a domain object, anything that you want to have is a first level derivative off of that. And we can do this to any problem. I've been using this example for a long time. And how many of you already know what event sourcing is? Okay, good number. Um, I'll try to go through the definitions and, and showing people it fairly quickly so we can get to the more interesting things. Now, this is my canonical piece of state. So we have a purchase order with N line items and some shipping information associated with it. This is not the only way of storing information, although this is what we've been taught to care about. How many of you spend large portions of your day talking about the shape of data? And if you start storing this, you run into all sorts of interesting problems. How many of you have written a SQL migration script before? Fun, right? Um, to be fair, I will never ever do a Big Bang release ever again where I take down a piece of software and bring it back up. The reason why is not because I'm worried that I will take it down and when I bring it back up it won't work. That's really easy, just do a rollback, right? What happens when you take it down and you bring it back up and then it works fine for a week? And then it breaks. How many of you write migration scripts to take the new schema with all the new data and bring it back to the old schema? So we've had a joke that um, when you have this problem where it runs for a week and then it dies, you have your choice. You can either wear the fireman hat or the cowboy hat. 
Um, to be fair, I actually recommend a lot of teams to do this. Um, the hats are, are basically a token, and if someone walks into your office and you're wearing the fireman hat, they just walk out. <laughs> oh, come on, how many of you guys have worked in production before, and then someone came in to ask you about the Christmas party? And you're like, get out of my office, but I can't say this. Now, this is our canonical piece of state, but this is not the only way of dealing with a set of information. I could also deal with it like this, where we have cart created, three items added, and then shipping information added. Now, that three items added is actually three distinct events. Um, if I put three distinct events there, the boxes just got really little and you couldn't read them anymore. But at any given point in time, I could take these five events and I could replay them and I could give you back this. In other words, I can give you back a piece of state, and what we're going to say in an event source system is that all state is transient. Don't get me wrong, it may be persistent, but it's transient. What matters is my events, because at any given point in time, I can always replay my events to give you back any piece of state in the entire system. My book of record is my events. If people here know functional programming, another way we could say this is that current state is a left fold of previous behaviors. I can fold over my previous behaviors and give you back some interpretation of it. And that may be your current er interpretation. Tomorrow it may be a completely different interpretation. And this is one of the main values of event sourcing, is that this concept of state becomes transient. Which changes more in your system? How you view your use cases or your actual use cases? Your events align directly back to use cases. Now, it took me forever to find that original slide because there's an accountant erasing in the middle of their journal. Accountants don't do this, <laughs> unless they work for Enron, in which case they probably do. In an event source system, we have no concept of an update or a delete. You can only ever append things. And this works the same way that accountants work. How many have taken an accounting class before? Maybe in university? Um, they probably told you that accountants don't work in pencil, they work in pen. Once you've put something into your ledger, you never ever take it out. And we do the same thing in event sourcing. Now I'm just curious, how many of you have an update or a delete statement in your system today? Okay, now keep your hands up. How many of you had a C-level board meeting to decide that, that that information was meaningless and it was perfectly fine to get rid of? How did you determine that that information had no value? How do you even do a cost-benefit analysis over information? So I've got some data today that's happening inside of my system. In order for me to do a cost-benefit analysis, I need to know how my business wants to look at this information in three years. How many of you can predict where your business is going to be in three years and what questions they'll ask you? So how do you make this decision to update or delete data? Do you take out your magic eight ball, shake it up and try to figure out what the business is going to ask you? How much does it cost to store one gigabyte of data for a year today? Yeah, to be fair, it's actually zero. You can just open up a Gmail account and store it in your Gmail account. <laughs> but it costs almost nothing. How many facts can you fit inside of a gigabyte worth of data? Let's imagine they're all 1K each. That's a lot of facts that you can store. You don't need to get a lot of benefit out of your data down the road. And I'm going to talk about this a bit more later, but I get this question a lot of, if I only ever just store everything, then my data is going to get really, really big. To be fair, most systems, I can fit your data on a micro SD. You're not big data. Even if you're appending, you're talking about, oh, so over the next five years, we're going to end up with 100 gigabytes worth of data. Okay. How much does it cost to store 100 gigabytes? We don't have an update or a delete operation when we talk about event source systems. There's only append. And just like what accountants do, we always append a new event. So if I were to go back and I were to look at accounting, let's say that I made a mistake and I transferred you 10,000 crown as opposed to 1,000 crown because I fat fingered it. Well, I just go erase the zero in the ledger, right? No, so I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to do what accounts call a partial reversal, in which case I'm going to put a journal entry that says I'm going to take 9,000 back from you and put it into the other account. Accountants don't like doing this. 
okay, if it's nice round numbers, 10,000 and 9,000, you can figure out what I originally intended to do is 1,000. What if there's six accounts involved and they're not perfectly round numbers? Well, then you have to take out a pen and paper and try to figure out what my original intention was. So instead, what accountants will do is they'll do what's known as a full reversal. I fat finger, I give you 10,000. I take 10,000 back from you. I mark that the first thing was in mistake and then I do what I actually intended. Why? Because an auditor can come back through here and he can figure out exactly what I intended to do. It's the same thing when we talk about event source systems. We tend to prefer full reversals as opposed to partials. But let's say I want to remove an item. I could say that we now have cart created, three items added, one item removed, and shipping information added. Is this the same as cart created, two items added, shipping information added? I always love this question because about half the room is going, yes, and half the room is going, no. And you haven't become a good consultant if you haven't learned the words, it depends. <laughs> There's actually a great page up on the C4 wiki about it depends. Now, if I were to look at it from this perspective, yes, those two are the exact same, correct? I'm going to get out an order with two line items and shipping information associated to it from both of those streams. What if I had a different perspective, though? What if I were counting how many times items were removed? Would they be the same? No. And this is actually a fun trick. If you can go into your system today and you can come up with any set of use cases that leaves you at the same ending state as another set of use cases, guess what? You're losing information. You just showed that you do not have a perfect hash. How did you value that information? Who did you talk to about it? This is one of the main benefits of event sourcing and why businesses actually go towards the concept of event sourcing, regardless of whether we talk about it in code or just conceptually. Event sourcing does not lose information. It is the only model that you can possibly use that does not lose information. And you can have lots of different implementations of it. A lot of accounting systems, for instance, they are a table with a descriptor column that says um, type of row, and then they join off to another table to get the rest of the information for that row. That is, at its heart, event sourced. They are storing facts and deriving state off of their facts. An event sourced system is the only possible way you cannot lose information when we talk about storing data. Any other form loses something. Now, to see the real value of this, what we have to do is we have to go through and try an example. So let's imagine that we're using this model for, I don't know, someone like Amazon. And our business user comes to us and he says, you know, I think people that remove their items from their carts within five minutes before they check out are more likely to buy that item in the future than the other things we randomly show them. Well, why do you remove an item from your cart five minutes before you check out? So you go and look at the cart, and it's going to be like 800 crown, and you're like, well, I could buy all that stuff, but my wife will kill me. <laughs> or I can remove three items from the cart, I can get some of the items from the cart, and my wife will not kill me. So I will take some of those. It's not that I don't want the other things, it's that I'm deprioritizing them compared to the rest. So with this model, we're now going to take this cart off the wall, and we're going to try to implement it. So I guess our first thing that we'll do is we'll add a new thing off the top called removed line items. And then what we're going to do is we're going to write a report that looks for removed line items and does a subquery back to see if the person has bought this in the future. So we put it out to production. Our business user says, I want to run this report. And they run it. What do they see? That report starts from here and moves forward. Let's try in this model. <coughs> Now, when we talk about deriving state off of an event stream, it's known as a projection. What we do is we project a set of state off of an event stream. If you're in the functional world, again, this is a left fold. It's a whole lot easier in the, in the functional world. Uh, they, they don't have all these fancy pattern names. So what I'm going to do is as I fold over the event stream, I'm going to look for an item removed. And when I find an item removed, I'm going to put it into my state as I'm folding over. And I'm going to say, I found this item removed, and now I'm looking for the checkout. When I get the checkout, I compare the time that the item was removed to the time of the checkout. If it was within five minutes, I mark that I am now looking for this item in the future, found equals false. 
And then as I go through all the rest of the events over time, if I find that the person actually bought this item, I mark found equals true. Easy enough. Now, what I haven't told you about projections, and this is a key idea in event source systems, is that they must start at event number zero. The very first event that your system put out is where a projection starts. And you run it all the way forward until it comes to right now, and then it continues into the future. And this may take a while. It may take a weekend. You can imagine you've got 500 million events. They, they, they don't go that fast, really. Um, we, we can currently get you up to about 70, 100,000 per second coming off of persistence. But even at that time, it's going to take you a while to replay. So we can imagine we start it off because it's going to go into SQL Server. Start off on Friday, come in on Monday. We now have our read model there. Our projection is completed. So now we write a report against our read model, or as uh, Martin would call it, an eager read derivation. Beautiful term, by the way. <laughs> What does my user see when he runs his report? Well, he sees all the data. We never knew that he would have this feature, but we didn't lose anything, so we were able to, to actually give it to him. Not only that, I can also go to my user and I can say, you know, this new report that you came up with, this is what that report would have told you on August 14th, 2011 at 1.34 in the afternoon if you had this report at that point in time. You can take any report and you can show it at any point in the history of the system. And you can do this and you can do it deterministically. Um, if anyone happens to work with machine learning, there's actually some very well-known algorithms for dealing with machine learning over event streams. In particular, it's called alpha beta training. So what you're gonna have is you can imagine alpha is at the very beginning of the list, beta is 10 events ahead. And alpha's job is to predict where beta is. But this is one of the major benefits of event sourcing. That you can go back and you can take new ideas and apply them to any point in the history of the system. You cannot change what happened in the past, but you can have a new perception of what happened in the past. Let's just bring that back to a real world example. And I don't recommend anyone does this, but imagine if you could take your current mind and bring it back to when you were 13 years old at your first dance can't change anything, but you can perceive it as you currently are. Don't recommend it. In general, most people are looking at event sourcing due to the, these kinds of reasons, these business reasons. However, there's a whole lot of programmer pornography associated with this. How many of you bought a hard drive before? So there's two speeds on a hard drive, right? There's one for writing sequentially, there's another one for writing random. Okay, to be fair, on SSDs, it doesn't really matter that much. But if I have an event log, if I'm actually storing this, do I write random or sequentially? Everything's sequential. And you can become very, very, very fast. Um, with a fairly naive setup on a single node, we can linearize you to probably 50 to 100,000 transactions per second. How many of you do more than 10? So we're a couple orders of magnitude above where you really need to be. And you'd be amazed how simple things get when you can actually linearize everything. But there's some other cool things that you can do. For me, the biggest one is this ability to go back in the past. And does anyone know what this is, this remote? They used to be really popular in America. They allowed you to go back and watch television. TiVo, exactly. Actually, to be fair, the biggest thing that they did was they let you skip commercials. And then they took that functionality away. They had the one button, it would actually find the end of the commercial. And you could just hit one button, and it would bring you right back to the show. But you can basically go forwards and backwards through time inside of an event source system. And time becomes explicit, which is another big thing. But there's some other really cool stuff that you guys can do. How many of you write smoke tests? So what I like to do is I store every command that my system has ever processed. You told me to do something, I wrote an event saying that I did something and I replay them every week. And I compare what I did this week when I reran every command my system has ever done to what it produced last week. Are these things that I expected to have change or are they things I didn't expect to have change as I change behavior over time? This is a really good smoke test 
Now this will not save you from all production bugs. Um, there, there are still black swans, sorry. But you should be reasonably comfortable pushing something to production if you've already taken that software and reran every single transaction your system has ever done before through the new software and not have errors. Or maybe you're bad coders, I don't know. You hide your, your bugs very well. But there's some other cool things that we can do. How many have heard of a super user attack? So the definition of a super user attack is a rogue system administrator or developer attacking your system. They have root access and they want to hack you. They probably have access to source. They can do anything they want, right? Years ago, I actually had to deal with one of these um, and we were building gambling systems and we were actually event sourced and we, we had to go one step further in our security so that we could prevent it. An event source system can prevent a super user attack. And if you want to go look this up, uh, the guy's name is Chris Harn. And there's a Wikipedia page, and there's actually a one hour HBO special about this guy. Um, it's Criminal Masterminds, which I never quite understood because all their criminal masterminds got caught. <laughs> so we had a pool, it was called a pick six. And basically, a pick six is you have to pick the winners of six races in a row. Obviously, that's hard and you get paid a lot of money for doing it. This was way back in the CSU DSU days. And what we were doing, instead of moving all the bets over the track, because when you bet this kind of pool, you normally bet like 100 bets at a time. What we were doing was we would actually store them at your local track until the end of the fourth race. And then we would only ship over the ones that could still win back to the host track. Well, that gets rid of 99% of your network traffic, which if you're going over serial ports is fairly reasonable. So what he was doing, he would go and put a bet, one, two, three, four, all, all, at a remote track. He would watch the first four races, and then he would go edit his bet on disk to change one, two, three, four with the actual winners of the first four races. Good scam, right? And he got caught. Um, not because he was stupid, but because he was unlucky. How many have heard of Breeders' Cup? It's the second or third largest race in America. And he was doing this scam during Breeders' Cup. And he went through and did everything went normal, put on the bet over the IVR, got on the machine, changed the bet, one, two, three, four, to the first four winners. And then two 99 to one horses came in the fifth and sixth legs. He was the only winning ticket in the world. It was like a $3 million ticket. Now, normally there's gonna be, let's say 30, 40 winners to this kind of pool. And you know, you're just gonna get paid. Here's your $100,000 payout, no big deal. What do you think happens when there's one winning ticket in the world? And the mutual manager goes and looks at it and it's a bet like five, three, seven, six, all, all. No punter would ever bet this because if, if any of the first four lost, your entire, all your tickets lose. So he sees this couple million dollar ticket and he says, let's, let's get on the phone with Catskills, figure out what's going on over there. Anything interesting? Oh, there's a developer on the maintenance line. That's interesting. <laughs> oh, the audit tape is ejected. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> but this is a fairly typical super user attack. And, and to be fair, most super user attacks, they will only ever get caught if they're unlucky. But we can prevent this with an event source system, and we did. How many have heard of something called a worm drive? Write once, read many. Once you've written to the disk, think about an old CD-ROM. You can only physically write to the thing once. You can't write to it multiple times. Now, if my current state is a first level derivative off of my audit log, you need to put something in my audit log to change my state. Now, if my audit log is on a worm drive, how, how do you attack me now? To be fair, there is a way. If I'm writing it very slowly, you could make an entire copy of the worm drive and you could switch them. We can reasonably control that. Um, I could write a message to the worm drive, let's say every 100 milliseconds. How many of you can change a worm drive for another worm drive within 100 milliseconds? I'll at least detect that somebody's probably changed a drive at this point. It's useful for this kind of situation. Now, I'm not going to say that you should only ever use event sourcing if you happen to deal with super user attacks. Um, it's just one of those things, if, keep it in your toolbox. If it happens to become useful, it'll be very useful. Now, conceptually, we always start at event one and we go to the end of the stream. 
And this works really well for most things. When we talk about event source systems, most event source systems are not having one giant log. They have millions of tiny logs. Think about a mortgage application in a bank. So it comes in, there's some approval process that it goes through, and basically you get events that are written. How many events happen to a mortgage application in a bank for a single mortgage application? Millions. For a single one? That'd be weird. They're very busy. <laughs> Normally, we might be saying 50. 50 things will happen to this throughout its life cycle. Um, uh, we can think about it as being a document in a document database. So we have all the events for a given document. Now, normally, this is not going to be a problem to go from one to the end of the stream replaying. It'll be very, very fast. Um, how much more expensive is it to read 20 rows from a database as opposed to reading one in terms of time to actually load it? However, there are some things this doesn't work so well with. Um, what if I were to take the order book of Google in the stock market at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon? How many things have happened to Google throughout the day? Okay, now you're millions. And if I want to do that, playing from one all the way to the end of the stream, even though I do that conceptually, would be very, very slow. So there's a related pattern where we can start dropping snapshots at given points in time inside the stream. So here, for instance, as opposed to reading from one to the end, I'm actually going to read backwards. And I'm going to start with six, and then I'm going to say, are you a snapshot? No. Five, are you a snapshot? No. Snapshot, are you a snapshot? Yes. So now I take my state at that point in time, and then I apply five and six afterwards. In general, never ever store your snapshots like this. Um, what happens when I store them like this, and we're currently at version four, and I say, okay, I'm going to write a new snapshot down, then he writes version five? Concurrency problem. Is my snapshot any less valid at version four because he put version five in the event stream? So you take your snapshots, add a version, and point back to the event stream. You basically store them off to the side. Along with this, you can have many, many different types of snapshots pointing back to the same event stream. Um, I can have 25 different folds that all go over the same event stream with their own perceptions of it, and I can snapshot all of them independently. In general, avoid snapshots if you can. And you can't always avoid snapshots. If you have something like uh, 5 million events for Google's order book, you need to have a snapshot at some point. But when you introduce a snapshot, you're going all the way back and you're introducing this again. And you will have all the same versioning problems that you end up with a SQL database or any uh, structure that you actually store. When I store events, I have a lot less versioning problems. I can bring up two servers side by side that each have their own perception of the data. And I don't need to talk about database refactoring patterns, although I really love that book in the series. When we talk about state, state is very hard to version. Now, what's really interesting for me about event sourcing is there are certain businesses that are out there that are already naturally event sourced. And if you introduce event sourcing to these people, it will make total sense to them. How many have talked to a lawyer before? So when I have a contract that's been written and then you want to make a change to it, we just go edit the contract, right? Or do we put addendums to the contract? And over, let's say, five years, we have 37 addendums to our contract, and the only way to figure out what our contract is is we take the original contract and we apply all the addendums to them one after another in order that they happened. Sound familiar? How many have been to a doctor before? Hopefully at least once. Now, when you go to the doctor, does he take a picture of you and put it in your file and throw away the other picture of you? Or does he constantly append papers into your file? And we wonder why they have a hard time understanding CRUD systems. When their conceptual model is, I have a file and I append things into the file all the time. We run into this a lot. There are a lot of domains that are naturally event sourced, and event sourcing is not a new thing. We're going to talk about this more, but I've managed to track it all the way back to Mesopotamia and Sumeria. So when people ask, like, well, how do I, how do I deal with this new thing? It's not new. How many use a SQL database today? Guess what? You're already using event sourcing. There's this thing called a transaction log in your SQL database. 
you're going to run into a problem. If I only store my events, how do I write a query? Um, I'm looking for all customers with the first name Greg. So I know we'll replay every event my system has ever done before. We'll fold over every single stream and we'll put a filter at the end of the fold to say whether or not it's currently Greg. This will be fast, right? Big O of N is awesome when we have uh, 500 million events. And most times when you're talking about event source systems, you, you don't query your events. You end up with a concept known as read models. And, and this leads you back to CQRS. We're going to talk more about CQRS. CQRS is mainly a teaching pattern. But I write events, and then I, I have n read models that I can actually read from. And this will actually save you quite a bit. How many have heard of these before? You know you're not cool if you're not using these, except for one of them. One of them's really not that cool. I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out which one. <laughs> but when I look at this, I, I am reminded of about a decade ago, especially in Scandinavia. How many of you remember these? Object databases were going to take over the world. They were 10 times faster on OLTP operations than SQL databases. They had no impedance mismatch between your domain model and your data storage. They were awesome. Or as my wife sometimes likes to say, avesum. <laughs> How many of you use an object database today? One. I thought they were going to take over the world. Does that remind you of these at all? Currently, we're saying these things are going to take over the world because they're, they're the new old thing. No one had ever come up with a key value store before. Document database, no one had ever heard of, oh wait, Lotus Notes. But why aren't people using these today? How many have used one of these? So I've worked on quite a few projects that used one of these, and it, it always ended up with the exact same failure. So we would build out our object database, and everything was beautiful with our domain model, and we could go back and forth, no impedance mismatch. We were really, really happy. And then one of these incompetent business people would come over, and they would ask us for a report. And they would want us to do something like roll up sales based on customer and town. And we'd go, well, that means I need to load up all those objects in memory. I can't do that. And then we remembered we had these things called SQL databases that were actually really good at this. And we decided that object databases totally suck because they don't do that very well. And therefore, we should always use SQL. And we run into this a lot where we come through and we want one tool that fits all of our problems. To be fair, you will never have one tool that fits all of your problems, no matter how hard you try. And every single database on the planet sucks. When we talk about databases, their, their writing isn't very interesting. Most of them, they work the same way as what we were talking about with event sourcing. They append to a log. Years ago, I was giving a talk actually about event store, which is the database I work on. And in my talk, someone actually said, you know, you guys work the same way internally as Cassandra. You're the same as Cassandra. It's like, yes, we use a log-structured merge. So does SQLite. So obviously SQLite also is Cassandra. When you talk about a log-structured merge, what I do is I append to a log, and then I've got chasers on the log that are updating in-memory structures, and then I batch update them down to disk. This is how many, many databases work. Think about SQL Server, your transaction file. Same general idea. When we talk about databases, what's interesting with them is not about their writing, it's about their reading. And we run into all sorts of accidental complexity if we have the wrong models. So you guys might have heard of this small startup before. What Twitter is in its core is a topic-based pub sub, correct? We have topics, names, hashtags, and people subscribe to topics. So if you ask me to build Twitter, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore everything that's been done in the financial industry for the last three decades, and I'm going to build it with Ruby on Rails and MySQL. Because that's obviously how you should build a topic-based pub sub, correct? How many of you remember the fail whale? 
Luckily, they had enough capital that they were able to get out of this problem. But they introduced massive, massive accidental complexity to the point they were managing hundreds and hundreds of MySQL instances to build a topic-based PubSub. Really bad idea. I would not recommend going that way. However, if you do happen to make the next Twitter, let me know. I'll invest early. But there's other examples of this. How many of you have created something like this before? So we have ID, parent ID, and some data. And what we're building here is essentially a tree. And you go and you release it to production. And they say, you know, it's taking nine minutes to bring up that report. And you go, but it works on my machine. So what's the problem? Well, on your machine, you've got about 100 rows in that table. In production, they've got 800,000. And you have built a recursive query. So you were smart. And I really want to know how many of you are willing to admit this. So you come up and say, I'm going to do this. So now we have parent ID 0, parent ID 1, parent ID 2, parent ID 3. And now you can do an OR query and get back all the rows that are underneath a given thing just by using your ORs on the parent IDs. Come on, be fair. How many of you have actually done this? I'll admit it. I've done it. And this is a piece of massive accidental complexity. Because we're trying to deal with this particular kind of read model, and we're forcing ourselves into it. An alternative to this might be this thing called a graph database. Graph databases are really, really good at dealing with this. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that you guys should go have a database per problem. Keep that as an opportunity, and then you can talk about the operational complexity that you introduce by doing it. Uh, at the end of the day, if I go put a graph database in production, somebody needs to maintain it. Operations needs to know how to back it up. They need to know how to deal with it. But these are all examples of accidental complexity. I actually watched this exact problem at a company in America. And what they had was they had people. And then they had a table called people relationships that linked two different people together based on a certain relationship type. And what they wanted to be able to query was, so from this person to this person, using only these relationship types, can I find a path? They had a half million dollar SQL server doing this. We replaced it over the course of two days with Neo4j, and the laptop was faster than their production server. This is normal when you choose the right model. Keep in mind that the wrong models will introduce massive accidental complexity to your system. When we talk about event source systems, we can have as many read models as we want inside of the system. All they have to do is subscribe to the events. They're just a projection. What we'll normally end up with is we'll store all of our events, and then we'll end up with n read models that are off on the side. Now, I know we're in Scandinavia. So I have actually done you guys the favor of giving you your questions. <laughs> and these are things I've heard over time. Like, for instance, event source systems need a service bus. No, almost nothing needs a service bus. <laughs> If you bring a service bus into the problem, you're probably making a bigger problem in most circumstances. Um, and to be fair, in, in most cases, like especially if you bring in something like BizTalk, you now have two problems. You have the problem that you have BizTalk and you have the BizTalk consultants, and they're going to take forever to get rid of. Now, I see people try to apply event sourced systems with service buses all the time, and they almost always fail. And the reason they fail is because there's two different kinds of subscription models. There's what's known as a consumer-driven subscription. Um, think a blog. And there's what's known as a, a, a server-driven subscription, which think AMQP. And normally, when we talk about a service bus, they're going to be using something like AMQP, RabbitMQ underneath, or MSMQ, or some WebSphere queuing system. Now, the problem that we run into is now we're publishing our messages off over the bus, but what happens when we have a new model? And our new model now wants to get our historical events through the service bus. So now we need a control channel. It needs to be able to talk to the thing on the other side to say, hey, by the way, I want all my history. And we got another problem. What do you do with the events that are currently happening while you're replaying that history through the service bus. The next thing you know, you're in this massive pile of accidental complexity. 
There's another way of doing this, and it's a consumer-driven subscription, which is what most people are using when they talk about event sourcing. How many have heard of something called Kafka? Kafka is a consumer-driven subscription system, and it works just like my blog. How many of you have a blog today? How many of you read blogs? Okay, so let, let, we're going to use RabbitMQ now to distribute my blog. So what's going to happen, because we're going to work just like this, when you want to read my blog, you send me an email saying, hi, I'd like to read your blog. Can you create me a queue? So I go through and create your queue for you, and now, you, now, now your, email cli or, sorry, your client for the blog will actually get the posts from your, your RabbitMQ queue. Cool. But then you decide you actually want to go read my older posts. So then you send me another email telling me to put all of the older posts into your queue for you. This is what I mean when we say control channel. You need to have this other mechanism of talking back and forth with me in order to make this work. A consumer-driven subscription works exactly like blogs. When you come to my blog, I give you an Atom feed. The Atom feed says, hey, this is where you currently are. Do you want to go to the oldest event? This is where the oldest event is, and then you can come forward in the stream all the way up until you get to current. Maybe you want to work like Twitter. So when you first come, you only want to grab the last 50. That's perfectly fine as well. The consumer remembers where they are in the stream, not the producer. Now, what happens when I've got 200 things subscribing over a consumer-based subscription? Well, it's no problem. What happens if you have a consumer-based subscription and you want to replay? You want to pull down all of my old blog posts? Do I, as a server, care? Do I have to do anything? This is the difference that we look at. And most people that are using service buses. They end up in this trap where they end up building control channels around everything. Event sourcing is more complex. More complex than what? Um, is it more complex to build an event source system than to build a typical CRUD app? Yes, but not because of event sourcing. It's because you have to go through and you have to figure out these things. They're called use cases. And you have to talk to people about how they want to use the software, not just what data they want to store and manage. And it's a different way of doing analysis. If you talk about systems where you're actually going with a use case driven approach and comparing them event source versus non-event sourced, they're roughly equivalent in terms of effort. To be fair, if you come into an event source system for the first time, you will have a learning curve. You guys have been working with CRUD for how long? You already know a lot of those little edge cases that you run into with CRUD. You know how to handle them, you know what the risks are, how to deal with issues in production. And there's a learning curve associated to get the same information out. This is one of my favorite questions. What big companies use event sourcing? Well, basically all of your database companies do. You're probably already using it, you just don't know it. And this is a really, really bad way of making decisions. Um, I, I actually die a little bit inside every time I read this on an email list. Because obviously, if this big company is doing this, then that makes total sense for us to do it because we're a big company and they're a big company. People talk about event source systems being slow. And you can imagine if I've got 5 million events and I have to replay 5 million events, that's going to be really, really slow. But what if I were to store them in an actor? And I would distribute my actors across a cluster and I would keep them all in memory. When would I have to replay at this point? When I lose one? What if I were to drop a snapshot every 1 million events? So now, we're capped. The most we'll ever have to replay is 1 million, and it's only in a failure circumstance. Otherwise, all my data is currently in memory. Does this sound like it'll be slow? You can make these kinds of systems very, very fast. In fact, if you start going, you start looking at systems that need to be fast, and they really care about things like latency, oddly, they tend to use these ideas. Things like trading. One of the biggest ones that kills me is that people have now associated event sourcing with object orientation, and in particular, domain-driven design. To be fair, an event sourced model is not object-oriented. It is functional. Um, when does an event change? So we have entire immutable data, and in order to get current state, we left fold over whatever 
things that we have in the past. This is obviously object-oriented, yes? But people have associated event source systems back to object-oriented and domain-driven design-based systems, and it's totally not. It is, it is inherently functional. It's a functional system of dealing with data storage. And I've been asked this question a lot. And the best framework that you're going to have is probably none. When you start going back and you start saying, I want to be able to replay these events to come forward, okay, it's a left fold. Do you really need a framework to implement a left fold for you? Although to be fair, there, there are some guys here in Aarhus that are building a CQRS framework. So when theirs breaks, they, they, they live locally and you can annoy them. So that may actually be a good one to look at. And over time, I've had a lot of people talking about this, this data requirement and we're going to store everything. We're gonna append everything in our system. How many of you have ever looked at what your current state is in your SQL database versus the size of your transaction log? Transaction log's a lot bigger normally. But what you really need to ask yourself is not about how much data we're going to have. What you need to ask yourself is at what current rate and what future rate will we, we be retaining data? And you need to take this and you need to bring it back and compare it to Moore's Law. If I were to go five years ago and buy a one terabyte SSD, how much would that have cost? Today, it'll cost you about 500 US dollars. I'm willing to bet you within three years, we'll have two terabyte SSDs. So you need to figure out not only what is my retention, but how does that curve fit when I, I plot it next to Moore's Law? And if you are slower than Moore's Law, huh? then guess what? Your data is going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to store over time. And there are some systems, uh, I can tell you today, you need to be sitting at about three to 5,000 messages per second before you actually have to start worrying about things. Once you hit that level, you do need to worry about things going into the future. If you're underneath that, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And there are some systems, but literally, how many of you guys have more than 10 transactions per second? Again, we're like two or three hands. Most systems are doing very small amounts of information and we are getting into premature optimization when we start talking about all these kinds of issues. And to be fair, if I can put all of your data on a micro SD, it's not big data. Now I've been talking with people about CQRS for a long time. And CQRS was never really intended to be much of a pattern. Um, I, I actually agree with the functional people when they say that we don't have these things called patterns, we just write code. And I don't need a pattern for every single thing that we're going to do. CQRS, the whole thing that was behind CQRS, was really to make people start looking at their domains in a different way, to lead them to everything else that we're talking about. It also leads them to things like building out actors for their domain model which doesn't work very well if you're supporting all of your reads off your domain model with a ORM behind it. Once you start saying that we're going to have our read models over here and we query them separately than what we actually write to, everything turns and it works out really well. But the main thing I had to do in, in bringing people towards this, these ideas was to give them something to separate the reading and the writing part of the process. Without that, they would never make the jump from object-oriented, and I, I, I use air quotes because they're not really object-oriented. Uh, they're like C++ object orientation. Domain model, two, going all the way to something which is event sourced with read models on the side. And CQRS has been a big part of that, but it's not something that you really need to go off and get really deep into. Um, to be fair, it's probably the dumbest pattern ever written. It, if you have a void return type, you go here. If you have a non-void return type, you go there. It's a whole pattern which also makes for a lot of fun when you hear people talking about how CQRS is crack for architects and you're like, uh, it's probably the dumbest pattern ever written. And that was already there. And I've gotten this one a lot. Um, to be fair, the only thing I can really say is thanks. It's not enterprisey. Um, at, at the same time, it will not cost you 
you know, a half million dollars just to get in something really simple. Um, you don't need a lot of the big frameworks people are using. Or, and if, if you really want enterprise-y stuff, well, IBM has a lot of stuff to sell you. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you guys for actually coming out. Um, I, I do appreciate that everyone actually came to the talk. And with that, if anyone has any questions. <coughs> uh, don't you have a problem when you need to decide which details to store in the event? Uh, because you don't know which details you're going to need uh, five years from now when you're going to build a new model. OK, that's fair. Um, so when we talk about the fact, oh, sorry. Um, it was uh, how do we determine which details to actually put inside of an event? And it is the exact same analysis that you do for use case analysis. Um, when we're, we're talking about what is the fact that actually occurred inside of our system and what do we care about. And this is absolutely an analysis problem and it takes some time uh, of working with it to get it right. Um, a normal follow-up question to this is what happens when what's in the, the fact changes over time and how do I version it over time? Um, for, I, I'm sure someone will actually ask that question. I always get it. There's a 45-minute answer to that question. Um, sorry. Uh, it's on ddcqrs.com, and it's in the middle of a six-and-a-half-hour video. It's about two hours in. Um, I would highly recommend watching the entire video, but that's, I'm biased. Um, when we talk about facts over time and how they change, generally what we start talking about is using um, hybrid or weak serialization in order to get that working as well. But you can do it with strong serialization. And I, literally, it's a 45 minute answer. So I was wondering about when you introduce uh, event sourcing for uh, already existing applications with an already established changing domain model, uh, what would be the best uh, way to kind of avoiding the Big Bang release? Cool. That's actually a great question. Um, and when we talk about migrating existing data over to an event source system, there are two ways of actually dealing with it. The first way that we can deal with it, uh, and that's actually the same way, I don't know if anyone here has ever worked with an accounting system. So it's the exact same things that you would do with an accounting system. So if at the end of the year I want to switch from Great Plains to SAP for my accounting, um, I've got two options. I can either migrate all of my data out of Great Plains and bring over all the transactions on all the accounts into the new system, or I can bring over just the initial balance of all of my original data. And, and there's times that you will use both. <coughs> and for any problem, you're going to use both of these solutions on it. Um, I will go, and let, let's just use DDD terminology quickly, aggregate by aggregate, and some aggregates I may, I may bring over as a snapshot, uh, a customer initialized event or customer initialized from old system. Other ones I may be able to reverse engineer the history and in those cases I may actually bring over the history uh, of the events as well. And what this can allow me to do if I, if, I, if I do it reasonably well I can actually start running side by side. So I make the old system at least raising the events along the way and it may still be storing off to a third normal form as well but now the new system is also raising events and what we can do is we can project those events back into the let's say third normal form model. So you can basically run side by side with these kinds of systems as you're moving. Um, in terms of migration, there are the two strategies. Um, and you, you can uh, and you will use both of them concurrently. Um, it, it's really a, a thing that you come into and it's aggregate by aggregate or document by document, depending how you want to look at it. And you, you will choose both strategies. We're a little over time, right? Oh, sorry. Okay, well then I will thank you guys for having come out. And uh, if you have questions, I, I know particularly in Scandinavia, people like to ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I'll be around probably most of the rest of the day today and at least in the morning tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>